Welcome to Keeping It Real with Janine, your guide to living an authentic, healthy life. I am Janine Strong, your guide. And today's conversation, I think you're going to find to be quite interesting. It is with Carrie Hummingbird. Carrie Hummingbird, Soul Guide, is a channel of and an embodiment of White Eagle, an ascended master who specializes in rainbow light activation of human DNA. Definitely want to talk about that. She has served as a social activist, leader, and philanthropist for over three decades. She's the founder of the Skills Not Pills movement and host of Soul Nectar Show. Carrie inspires people to lead their lives wide awake with an authenticity, passion, and purpose that positively impacts others. She catalyzes mind shifts that transform life challenges into gifts of wisdom with her Reinvent Yourself program. Carrie is the best-selling author of The Second Wave, Transcending the Human Drama, her newest book, and the award-winning book, Awakening to Me, One Woman's Journey to Self-Love, which describes the early years of her spiritual awakening. Hi, Carrie. Hi, Janine. Thank you so much for having me on your show. Oh, well, I'm very excited. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. I'd like to read just a little something that I think I got it off of one of your web pages, um, a little paragraph that I think is important. Reinventing yourself is the most powerful act of sovereignty you can claim for yourself. It's a huge bid for power. Every hurdle is deliciously sweet in the wisdom squeezed from the experience. You transition from an asleep person with a programmed mind into a wide awake co-creator of the epic story of your life. So well written, my dear. Oh, thank you. <laughs> it makes me feel yummy just listening to it. It, <laughs> it is yummy. It yeah, helps. it really is. <laughs> I love that. Every hurdle is just deliciously sweet in the wisdom squeezed from the experience. That just, you know, I, I mean, I can see it. It's just... <laughs> so yummy. Yes, it oh, is. I love it. It's, it's my game. It's my gig. I love all this wisdom that we get from these life experiences. Mm -hmm. Now, you didn't have a particularly joyful start to life from reading your book. That's what I gather. And, you know, you've had your, your hurdles to overcome and challenges. H how did you become interested in all of this? Was there something in particular that like the light bulb went off or, or was it a gradual thing or were you just born like this? <laughs> All of the above. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think I came in an unexpected bundle of big joy mm -hmm. and into an environment where, you know, I was born in 1969. And so if I look back to where my mom and my natural father were in their development, it was the 60s. It was mm. the summer of love, as you know well. Mm -hmm. It was, you know, that time frame of like rebellion and change and the civil rights and exposing some sh really big shadows in the collective right. and and the hippie movement and free love. And, and so my natural father was, you know, really uh, excited by all this free love and all of this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And then my mom was from Midwest Texas and she'd been raised Southern Baptist, you know, five days mm. a week at church with my grandmother, who was very, very devout ah. and, you know, a community leader. And so my mom was kind of like hot between two worlds within herself. Like, mm -hmm. well, I don't really believe all this stuff because I see that people are you know, going to church five days a week, but then they're still saying, I can't serve this, this black man, his milkshake in a glass. Oh God, yep. Mm -hmm. Or I can't go into this bathroom or they can't come in my bathroom, you know, mm -hmm. so this doesn't seem mm -hmm. right. And so she's in her own rebellion. She moves to Dallas and she meets my natural father who like, there's, you know, there's chemistry, there's, there's like, you know, the rebel, uh, naughty <laughs> boy and my mom who's like, yeah, I want some of that. You know, I'm tired of this, this, you know, hypocritical stuff that's going on and all these rules uh -huh. that no one's following. So, and then I pop out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then you. <laughs> <laughs> 
And, you know, and then my mom's Christian values start to kick in like, oh, no, this is not a safe place to raise a child. This is not good. You know, like he's he doesn't have very many boundaries. He had, you know, kind of a rough start himself with some child abuse and being left outside of hotel rooms with his mom with men inside. And Aww. so, you know, so here I come <laughs> into that. So mm-hmm. my life is, you know, began in that turmoil. And then my mom, you know, tried to find some safety. She married a you know, my first stepfather and he turned out to seem like a really great upstanding individual and very reliable. And then he turned out to be a violent drunk. You know, it's oh, kind of, God. you find out when you mm-hmm. get him home. Mm-hmm. You know? yep. Oh, yep. Sometimes it's hard to know in the beginning. <clears throat> so, and in those days you couldn't really, as a woman, it was very challenging to support a child by yourself and be independent. It, there's, yeah. there was this idea you really had to have a man. And I mm-hmm. think you're, you're, you're from a time frame. Yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes, so that's kind of that situation that my mom found herself in. And so we were with this violent drunk for the next four years. So my early childhood, zero to five, was, you know, first this free loving, free willing, peace, love and happiness, hippie sort of guy. And then this really terrifying, you know, violent drunk and, and wounded man and coping with um, hearing my mom getting beat up and, and these terrible things that were happening inside the home. And that was just frightening for somebody that was as young as I was. I can imagine. I would think it would also be very confusing, you know, to have these, <laughs> these two men in your life who neither is particularly, um, I don't want to say normal because, you know, what's normal, but uh, have have their act together. and and uh, But they're like at two different ends of the spectrum. Yeah, there are two different ends of the spectrum. I, yeah, it's it's true. And then, so at five years old, we moved to New England with this man, and something really beautiful happened, which is that my not my my dad, the man who would become my dad, my step my second stepfather, mm-hmm. showed up. Mm. And you know, third time's the charm. <laughs> my mom finally got one that was awesome. Uh. And she really hit the payload because my not my dad, my my second stepfather, my dad. He is just was an amazing person. He died a few years ago, but he mm. was that kind of person, a kind of man that humble and wise and would just magnetize people to him because mm-hmm. of his gentle, loving, kind, unconditionally present nature. And and I talk about it in the book, but my dad, I believe, was you know, an aspect of White Eagle as well. It's like mm-hmm. <laughs> just mm-hmm. to be sure that I was getting my lessons. Um, you know, we just decided that this would be a good way to raise me, you know, to actually have presence with me, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. to teach me lessons. So, mm-hmm. so there a big, a, you know, big healing of that began, but it, you know, the thing is, is that those early uh, childhood experiences, they don't just go away. They right. don't, they come back in your life and they're part of the framework of how your brain was formed. And so, and they get triggered. They do. And you, and I picked a husband that was in some of these patterns. And, um, of course, eventually what I realized through my big healing is that these patterns got set in my brain and it wasn't just the father figure that I had to contend with. It was also my mom Mm -hmm. and her lineage, um, of matriarchy and how that lineage of women responded to challenges. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's been a quite a mix of exploration and healing. And so what happened was I you know, got to the end of my rope in my marriage, my 20 year marriage, which was operating from all of these patterns. And it, at some point, it just becomes too painful to keep operating from those patterns and without relief. Mm-hmm. And psychotherapy was not a solution. It did not really, it helped me to understand some of what was going on and to become aware of my thoughts mm-hmm. and patterns, but it didn't really give me a healing. It didn't help me to transform the situation. Got it. Mm-hmm. So I, I ended up at the bottom of a pit, just kind of like, I just don't want to be here anymore. Mm-hmm. But I had two little kids now. Mm. So what am I going to do? Leave? Yeah. Yep. So I had to f- find a solution. So I became rebellious and I left and I said, well, I'm not going to do any more of this, these pills and I'm not going to do any more of these psychotherapy sessions because it didn't work and I'm just going to be bad, I guess. Be <laughs> a shitty person, you know? Aww. Well, that was kind of where I was at. Uh-huh. And the cool thing is that at that point, another door opened for me and that was my spiritual door. 
And that's really how I got on the path of being who I am today is a shamanic healing Mm -hmm. that I I didn't even know that was possible. And I stumbled into that and it changed my life. And I felt different in 40 minutes. I thought, well, that was 40 minutes versus 20 years. Wow. Something shifted. And what was it? What was it that, uh, what was this shamanic healing? I'm sure the listeners would like to know when you're saying you had such an incredible uh, experience. (laughs) It was, it was powerful. I actually had met a new friend and she was telling me one night that she had had a powerful experience with a shaman. So I went home and I thought, Ooh, you know, I don't mm-hmm. know what that is, but I want to find out. So I wrote shaman in Austin. You know, mm-hmm. Cause that's where I'm living. And I found this teacher, this shamanic practitioner, Gary Starnes, who's a uh, local here. He helps a lot of women with um, trauma, mm-hmm. early, early life trauma and things, traumatizing things that happen to them in their lives. That's kind of his focus. Okay. And I found him and I booked an appointment with him and he said, you're perfect in, for my program. And I thought, wow, somebody actually wants to try to help me because all these psychologists are like, you're hopeless. You know? mm. <laughs> so wow. I, I finally got into this program and part of the program was we were learning about the four agreements and things like mm-hmm. that, mm-hmm. which I think should be handed out to every third grader. Oh, God, the- you and me both. I have, I don't know like, how many please. times I have said every, yep. if every person read the four agreements on this planet and lived their life that way, this would be a totally different planet. I have bought that book for so many people. It's, I think, I it's, love that book. Absolutely. Don Miguel Ruiz, for those who haven't read it. It's a little book. It won't take you long to read it. And it's amazing. It's life changing. <laughs> yes. Mm-hmm. And I, you read it the first time and you think, oh, this is easy. I can do this. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, just to give you an idea of how mentally bound up I was in my patterns, mm-hmm. I actually read that book 30 times front to back. Just oh, my to goodness. Because it, <laughs> it was hard to get it. You know, uh-huh. I, I seemed to make so much sense, but then I couldn't do it. So anyway, so this healing was part of the program and um, he offered a shamanic healing to the, the participants in his program. And my first healing, I remember I walked in and he had me lying on the floor, mm-hmm. which I thought in my mind, I was thinking, wow, now I've been demoted. You know, I used to be on the couch and now <laughs> I've got to lie on the floor. You know? <laughs> okay. <laughs> So I was lying there and my brain was just going busy. And I thought to myself at one point, okay, Carrie, Gary was telling us to get into your senses and just suspend your disbelief. So just like act as if anything could be possible for a moment, Mm -hmm. just try. Mm -hmm. And so I, in that moment that I made that decision to just try to pretend like it could be possible, I could heal Mm -hmm. in that very instant he had been drumming and going on a journey for me, he stopped drumming the instant I made that choice. Interesting. And the instant he stopped drumming, I felt this presence come in over me, this loving presence hovering over my body. Mm. Mm-hmm. And in that moment, I had such awe, like, oh my gosh, <laughs> like for one second, I decided it might be possible to heal and I should give it a try. Wow. And mm-hmm. here is this miracle. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So he proceeded to move his hands and take energy with his hands out of my chest. And it was invisible, right? So I couldn't really see anything, but I could feel, feel something mm-hmm. being released. Mm-hmm. And I could feel it being flicked into this dish of burning sage. Mm-hmm. How do I feel that? So my mind's going like, what is happening? And my <laughs> mind is like, this is crazy. and. I just started really paying attention to everything that was happening to me. And then at the end, he gave me this, um, what felt like a stick. He put it in my hand and then he put both of my hands over my heart and I burst into tears and I had Mm -hmm. no idea why, Mm -hmm. but something so Mm -hmm. profound had just happened. And when we sat up, he gave me some water and we just compared notes. And I said, what, what is in my hand? And I look and it's this little crystal. I'm like, what is this? Because when you put it over my heart, I just, burst into tears. He said, that's your innocence. Oh. That my innocence mm-hmm. had flown out of my body at one years old with this incident with my natural father, which is the reason my mother left him. Mm-hmm. She didn't want me to live a life of being molested by somebody who was really wounded inside. Mm-hmm. 
so that incident, I took responsibility for everything going on between my adult parents as if it was my fault. Mm. And I let my innocence go and I took on my mother's shame. Yeah. Wow. And my life just took that trajectory. Mm -hmm. So I could see it so clearly. And it's not like that was the only healing I ever had. That was the doorway to many, 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 many more healings and mm -hmm. many more realizations and plant medicine and, you know, German journeys and healings with shamans and training and all kinds of things. But that really opened the door to a whole nother world that I didn't even up until now know that that was there. Mm -hmm. Wow. That's really profound. I can feel that in my chest. I'm just. Wow. It was powerful. Mm -hmm. And I can really talk about it without bursting into tears because it was so powerful for me that for a long time, I would start crying if I told that story. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I can imagine. I mean, it's like you've been living your life up until that moment in like in a little box, in a little cage, right? Mm -hmm. And this, mm -hmm. this uh, healing... Um, opened up, yeah, like you said, opened up a door to you to a whole world, a whole way of being, a whole way of seeing, feeling that you had no idea even existed. It's really hard to live a human existence. Yes. <laughs> when you don't know that you have a soul and a spirit to guide you. Mm -hmm. And even with that, it can be difficult. <laughs> Even with that, but I mean, I was reflecting back. I had a plant medicine ceremony where recently in the last six months or so where mm -hmm. I was talking to White Eagle and, and White Eagle said, so what do you think the major lesson is for you? And I said, well, he said, why do you think everyone suffers so much? And I had Good just, question. I had just come into this ceremony because I was parking my car and it was in a neighborhood in San Antonio that's a little a little rough and there mm -hmm. was a man who, who was Latino walked by and kind of looked didn't look at me but sort of like sideways glanced and looked down mm -hmm. and I when he did that I saw he had those tears on the side of his face mm -hmm. that indicate that he was a gang member and he'd probably killed somebody oh okay and I had this fear, like, oh, oh. this person, you know, and I was judging him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like he was fear worthy, right? I mean, right. there's discernment, but there's also like judgment. And I right. was in a space of like, this is probably not a good person kind of thing. Okay. So I went into the plant ceremony that way. And, and White Eagle says to me, so you notice your judgment. Why do you think it's so hard for somebody like that? Mm. Good and I said, well, I mean, I've had a pretty rough time. I said, I think it's worthiness. I think it's not feeling worthy of love. Mm. And he's like, bingo. <laughs> and then he reminded me of like tales I'd heard that at some point, I don't know where I heard this story, but that the angels decided humanity was just, why are you making humans? This is pointless. Really arguing with God about humanity and like, it's not worthy. And, you know, why are, why are you doing this? And and I thought, wow, it's all that judgment. Mm. And if we could only feel worthy of love, which is what we are, right. how, wouldn't that change the world? Because it's sure hard to live life without love. That's very true. So who is White Eagle? What? Tell us a little bit about him. him I assume well, I started, him. I started meeting White Eagle probably early on. I mean, because I kept seeing signs and clues and things that attracted my attention. It didn't necessarily attract everybody's attention, but it really attracted mine. Okay. Like there was this commercial when I was really young that would come on the television and it was about cleaning up the environment mm -hmm. and it had a native American man and his, and he, his, he would have a tear roll down his cheek because people were littering. Mm -hmm. That really caught my attention. Mm, interesting. And I don't think a lot of other people were attracted by it, but it sure caught my attention and things like that would catch my attention. Mm -hmm. And when I was started my um, training with Gary Starnes, we learned about drums and the effectiveness of taking a drum journey because I had a super busy mind and it just would never shut up. 
So, Mm -hmm. you know, I, it's not, I could not just sit still and be quiet and meditate. Like that is not something I could do. So they introduced me to the drum because the drum is actually a way to bring your brain into trance. Mm -hmm. So you could actually relax. Yeah. So I started practicing with the drum and I would listen to in the bath. I would listen to, um, Sandra Ingerman has a whole uh, Mm -hmm. CD of drum soul journeys. It's called and it's Mm -hmm. drum journey meditation. So one day I was listening to that and I was really out there, you know, just one of these meditations. And all of a sudden in my third eye, in my inner vision, I saw this like telescope coming closer and closer, like with its end, the circular end coming closer and closer and closer right up to my face. Oh, interesting. And it had this, this piece, it had this like Indian chief with the headdress and everything in uh-huh. it. And he looks at me and he says, open the sun in their hearts. And then he goes. <laughs> I'm like, what does that mean? <laughs> open the sun in their hearts. Like, can you explain? Yeah, that? right. Can I have a little more information, please? <laughs> a little bit more. So that was one of the first introductions. And then I just was like, okay, I don't know what that was, but I looked it up and I saw a picture of a Cherokee chief headdress and I was like oh well I am part Cherokee and uh, you know Uh I don't have direct access to that but Mm -hmm. through my lineage or ancestry.com or whatever but it is there Mm -hmm. and I thought well maybe that's an ancestor you know so okay and then I just sort of put it aside it's like I wrote it down but then I was like okay well I don't know how to explain that so so then a couple years later I I I just kept getting more and more intense desire to reconnect with my ancestry Mm mm-hmm and I was, I uh, went on a camping trip to the Smoky Mountains and I went to the Akana Lofty village and I went to the museum and I was just looking for help to reconnect because I didn't really know that I would be able to find it in the third dimension since my ancestor changed her name so she could pass for white. So I wasn't oh. sure mm-hmm. that I would ever find it that way. So I wanted some shamanic help. Mm-hmm. You know, I wanted somebody to help me connect etherically. Okay. I got nowhere except I got told that my my ancestor loved the people and so she could pass for white so she she was a traitor and you know that's what the guy at the the young guy from Oklahoma at the museum told me and I thought well I understand you know I was really angry at first but then Mm -hmm. I realized well of course he feels that way you know I mean look at everything as people suffered so Mm -hmm. so I left that alone uh for a little while but then it kept coming back it wouldn't leave me alone so I I finally went back again uh, two years later back to the Econolofty village and I was with my sons at this time and I asked around again, by now I'm kind of desperate and I'm crying. So they Mm -hmm. really want to, you know, like, okay, but you know, there's probably like a million white women like me that go there and ask, you know, for help. Yeah, that could be true. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know, so I went there and they finally led me to this man, Bruce, who was happened to only be there for the day. (laughs) Of course. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> and he goes, okay, I'll help you all in the parking lot when I'm done with my shift. I said, okay. So on the way out to meet him in the parking lot, I, all of a sudden I felt this whoosh of energy through the back of my head, like mm-hmm. a softball got flung through the back of my head. Oh, wow. Okay. And it started expanding. Mm-hmm. And then I was dizzy and I had to sit down. I'm like, boys, I've got to sit down. I don't know what just happened. Something is in my head. Like it's, it's expanding. I'm seeing the trees breathe. And, oh, wow. And, and this began my journey with the Native American peace chief, White Eagle, mm-hmm. from my ancestry, who is also part of White Eagle, the Ascended Master, mm-hmm. that started my relationship with this masculine, this um, medicine person this person of peace from the trail of tears. Mm-hmm. And I remembered the trail of tears. Like I remembered being there. I, re- I mean, the grief I felt, uh, was profound. I've processed mm-hmm. a lot of that, but it was years mm-hmm. of, of feeling grief, um, mm-hmm. over that life's experience. Wow. So I've, I've integrated with this, um, through a lot of healings and a lot of journaling and a lot of plant medicine and, other modalities just to, to integrate this aspect with the aspect that was carry Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. up until now. Mm -hmm. And now it's a blend. Now it feels very integrated to me. So, wow. Kind of experience. Yeah. (laughs) Well, you know, Carrie, one of the things that struck me in reading your book 
is that I really, I, I don't know that I had really considered quite so much, but the the importance of ancestry and lineage and mm-hmm. how that comes forward into our human body, into our DNA, our genetics. And that oftentimes, like for example, I've always throughout my life felt this on and off overwhelming sadness that has never seemed like it really was mine, you know, from my experience in this lifetime. And I've often thought that maybe I was tapping into uh, a planetary sadness. But after reading your book, I'm wondering now if maybe it was it's more of a, a lineage or an ancestral kind of thing. I think it's quite possible. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> because, you know, here's something really fascinating I learned subsequently. This is after I published the book. I've okay. realized this. This was that same plant medicine ceremony where I was judging the man. Okay. And I realized... Because I've been working to heal the mother wound as well. That's my new book that's coming out in January Mm. is Love is Fierce, Healing the Mother Wound. And I've been working with white buffalo calf women for that Mm. work. Mm -hmm. And so in the process of working on that, I've been asking the question, how can I come to peace with how my mom is and just accept her the way she is? Because up until now, it has been challenging Mm -hmm. to, Mm -hmm. to do that. Sure. And so during this ceremony... What came to my awareness was, well, here is a reason why you should maybe not judge your mom, is that guess what? You were this other person, this Cherokee peace chief. And when I was in that lifetime or the aspect of me in that lifetime or my ancestor, white eagle, however you want to look at it, Mm because it's so hard to talk about this. Right. But when I was that lifetime, I made a choice out of responsibility for the tribe to take my life Mm -hmm. in my physical body because by taking my life in my physical body, I would be able to be all places at once and help everybody that needed help. There were too many people that needed help for me to help them in my body. Mm -hmm. Okay. Makes sense. But you can imagine that that in the, for people not aware of the capability of a person to do such a thing Mm -hmm. with less awareness about spirit and going behind the veil and it not being a bad thing. Mm -hmm. People more in the 3d experience, they were like judging that I did that. And like, I left the people and I, I let, I abandoned them in their hour of greatest need. And that fell on the shoulders of my children. Mm -hmm. So, you could imagine now the, the quote sin or mistake or whatever Mm -hmm. judgment about my decision Mm -hmm. rippling now down the ancestral line, seven generations, which is my son in this life. Okay. He's the last. Mm -hmm. That's the seven. Okay. So the, our, the effects of our big decisions, they last for seven generations. What is it about the seven? I don't know, but it um, is an important number. <laughs> right. I know it. I know it is. And um, I've always wondered why, you know, why seven? You know, why not just is. six or eight or whatever? It just mm-hmm. takes that long for it to work its way out. Mm-hmm. I mean, unless you're really conscious. So in this lifetime, a lot of us are doing very conscious work in order to accelerate the process. Right. But so I came back in to this lineage as me now and then join with this other aspect of myself to create a bridge or like an encompassment of the lineage up until now, like between the two points to create healing in that space. Mm -hmm. That accelerates the ancestral healing process. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so now my son can be free if he chooses to be. Okay. So, so this is a lot of um, what we're doing on the planet at this time. That's what the second wave is actually here to do. Well, that was my next question. <laughs> nice yeah. segue, my dear. Yeah, there you go. So, yeah, so, let's talk about the waves. You and I have had a little chat about this and um, Dolores Cannon and her book, The Three Waves of Volunteers, which, as I shared with you, was a life-changing book for me because I'm of the first wave uh, because of my 
I mean, that's my understanding that because of my age, my age category is the first wave of volunteers, and then you are in the second wave. Yes, I'm at the beginning of the second wave, and my 21-year-old son is at the end of the second wave. Okay. And so we sandwich the second wave together. Okay. So the first wave of volunteers came in in the 60s, were in their adulthood in the 60s. Mm-hmm. So let's say that. Right. In your effectiveness, in your ability to enact change mm-hmm. and to be an agent of consciousness was the age that you were at when the 60s were happening mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and the 70s. And so if you look back, you know, this is what I do is I look back and I look at the music of the 60s and the expressions of the 60s and like especially the song The Age of Aquarius. Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, these people are aliens. There's no way that's a human being (laughs) (laughs) like like straight up from generational uh, domestication. Put, putting that song and that vibration out into the world. That's mm-hmm. not possible. So it's clear that something's happening that's right. otherworldly, you know, at this point. And the fact that that came in in the 60s was really to plant the seeds. So Martin Luther King, you know, there was a lot mm-hmm. of like heavy trench work and bushwhacking done by the first wave because, of course, everything was very, very stuck in the patterns of judgment and condemnation and control and power over and all of these things that had just been playing out the human drama for thousands of years. So with astrology, you can kind of think like astrology, as we're approaching the new moon, for example, there's a waning in of those energies. Mm-hmm. Okay. And there's a waning out of those energies, right? There's a mm-hmm. there's several days to, or at least on either side of any major astrological event. Right that it comes into play. So the same is true for this larger context. So the date, the age of Aquarius is opening. And of course, everybody is very certain that that's happening <clears throat> December 21st, right? 2020. Okay. So of course, it needs a phase of time after thousands of years. It has to wane into being. You know, it has to start waning into being as coming into being, like waxing into being, I guess would be the word. Mm -hmm. It needs to start growing and expanding into being. So you can't wait till, you know, November 30th, 2020 to start the process. Like you got to start it way ahead of time to plant the seeds. And where are you planting the seeds? Well, you know, you have the generation of the first wave that's coming in and seeing, and they have this tremendous mission of doing something that's completely contrary to what's being done in the world. Mm -hmm. It's like completely adverse, which is peace and love and all of this, of the hippies and all of this movement. And then they're having children and they're planting these ideas very firmly in the minds of their children. Mm -hmm. And so now you have that second way would be me. We've been raised with those ideas We've been conditioned and programmed with those ideas. And so that's normal for us to think like, well, of course, you should respect every person and you should honor. And not to say that everybody was trained this way, but certainly the the children of the first waivers or the children, kind of anybody in that sphere, your, your whole thing is to, um, to create that worldview. Mm-hmm. But it's natural. Yes. So the second, <laughs> so the first wave you could think of is like a bushwhacking. And creating the teachings and the ideas that the second wave then grew up thinking were normal, like Mr. Rogers. I mean, please, Mm. totally a waiver. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And look at how many minds he influenced. Right. Yes. He influenced mine, Mm -hmm. for sure. Mm -hmm. The Electric Company, Sesame Mm -hmm. Street, all Mm -hmm. of these things, they, they sparked my whole generation. Right. So the, the second waves are here to um, embody the patterns of human suffering in the ancestral line and do ancestral healing. So our lives have been a bit chaotic up until now. Um, generally speaking, um, lots of patterns of human suffering and a, a very um, sensitive ability to perceive and to feel. So very empathic. So it makes it more painful to experience these things because you're not numbed out to it you actually feel it Mm -hmm. so um 
so that way um, it's very, it's even more painful because you can really feel the nuances of it. And then the job, of course, is to get more and more open in your heart and then you feel it more and more. And so there is this um, drive towards healing in the second wave. Like everybody in the second wave is like, comes in and knows in their hearts, I know this is not how it's supposed to be. <laughs> so I have to do something to fix this. Yes. And that's kind of where we all start is <laughs> mm-hmm. that drive to fix it because there's a problem here. <laughs> you know, we're calling God saying there's a big problem here on earth. <laughs> mm-hmm. This is not the way it should be. Um, right. And it's that drive. It's that drive to heal and to understand human psychology, like to figure it out. Mm-hmm. Like, why are people acting this way? What's going on? So human psychology, spirituality, um, just really nutrition, like anything having to do with better health is mm-hmm. really second wave. Right. And that's emotional, mental, and physical health. Right? All levels. Yes. Mm-hmm. Spiritual. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And oh. like obsessed with it, you know, so we can't not do it. We have to because our own families are the incentive for us doing it just so that we can have a nice life ourselves. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so right. and then. We're all asleep. Like most of the second wave has been asleep. I, th- I think there's more, f- like there's a lot of first waivers actually kind of n- new. Like we're conscious, like, okay, I know I'm not from here. <laughs> like there's, <laughs> I don't fit in. I've known that for a long, long time. <laughs> and you had to have that awareness in order to keep going because mm-hmm. it's like, mm-hmm. other. but see the second wave, a lot of the second wave, we had earth amnesia. Now, what because, is, why, why, that's always bugged me, why we have to have earth amnesia. <laughs> well, okay, because the second wave is here to heal patterns of trauma in the ancestral lines. So okay. in order to heal something, you have to experience it. You can't just, you know, you can't mm. deal with that if you haven't experienced it. You can't help anybody else with it. Mm-hmm. If you really want to mm-hmm. understand human psychology, you have to go through these experiences. Right. But if you remember that you were going to do that, wouldn't it make it even harder to go and do it? I mean, it would be really hard. Most to likely, put your yes. Or incest <laughs> or molest or anything, you know? Mm-hmm. It, it's hard to do that to yourself. So, yeah, you have to forget that you're you. And you have to go into this amnesia where you don't have the bigger perspective for a long time. Mm-hmm. And because you really immerse in this. Because if this is all you have then you're going to do something about it. Like if you really believe this is all there is, this is what I've got. So then you're going to do something with it. But if you have the bigger perspective, you might not. You might be like, ah, this is one life, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Uh-huh. Okay. All right. I get that. But it's deep inside, so you, know, you know there's so much more. Deep inside, I've always known. Like there's always been that wisdom inside me. But it would appear, it would it would be revealed every so often. And then I would go, oh, yeah, I know everything's okay. Mm -hmm. But then I would go back to this drama and chaos, you know, Mm -hmm. so I needed to experience it. Mm -hmm. So how do we transcend this human drama? By waking up and remembering who we are, right? That's the point. So that's why I had to write the book when I wrote the book. Essentially, um, there were people that needed to be in position for 2020. Mm Mm-hmm. And in order to get them into position, they had to wake up. So I was prompted to write the book, The Second Wave, which is an activation. Because when you read it, you're like, oh, my God, I know this is true. Wow. Mm-hmm. You know? Mm-hmm. <laughs> so Absolutely. that it started in 2019. Now I had a very short time frame. I was told in February I was writing the book. I channeled the book in like two months. Wow. To- three months tops. I had it reviewed. I had the landing page up for pre-order. And then it published in July. So it was just like, bam, bam, bam. Yeah. And wow. the reason why is because there were people in my sphere who needed that book to wake up so they could do their purpose awake. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And now it's still rolling out. So like more and more people are, you know, getting, they need to get in position. So whoever needs to get in position finds that book. And then they wake up and they remember, they read the thing, they go, oh, that's right. Because in order to do your purpose, you've got to be operating from your book of destiny. If you're still in your fate and you're still mired in your human drama and, you know, oh, my mom did this to me and I can't get over it, Mm -hmm. then, you know, how effective are you going to be? Right. Right. So it sounds like forgiveness is a big chunk of all of this. 
Well, and this is why I wrote the book, Healing the Mother Wound, because forgiveness is a very interesting topic. And sometimes people have used it as a spiritual bypass for actually feeling all the feelings. Mm, Because mm -hmm. true forgiveness, when you get to the space of true forgiveness, you actually don't need to forgive. You don't need to ask for forgiveness anymore or to receive it. You're just like, oh, well, it's not needed because in its place is gratitude. Mm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in other words, when you really get the bigger picture and you really in your soul vision, you see that every single thing that happened in your life was happening to refine you and grow you and help you with your your sole purpose, what you came here to experience and to elevate your human consciousness through, it's all here for that purpose. So there's no need for apology or even, you know, Mm -hmm. to say, to say anything other than thank you. Like really thank you is the answer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that experience or for allowing me to have that experience. And you can't get the you until you felt all the pain and come to terms with it mm-hmm. and then transformed it into wisdom. Right. <laughs> so, well, yeah. and the other thing is, you know, not to take every anything personally <laughs> or agreements. <laughs> um, yeah. That was one that and never assume those were my two. Those are the two that I really had to work on. Okay. So not taking anything personally. So uh, the reason I'm saying that is that the, for me, the idea of forgiveness is more often not taking something personally, like that other person is doing, it's about them. It's not about you, right? So it kind of helps, for me, it helps me to let go of whatever I'm feeling um, because it's not about me. It's about what they need to go through, what they need to learn, what they're dealing with. It's not about you and it is about you if you feel a trigger. True. It, because people mirror us, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Right. That is a kind of a yes and conversation. And a lot of people in our culture, though, they go, and my, this, you know, people close to me also have said this. Well, I forgive you, mm-hmm. but I'll never forget it. <laughs> well, then you're going well, forgive gee, me. Yeah, right. Yeah. If you haven't, if you're still holding out, like, I'm never going to forget that, but I forgive you, then that's just that forgiveness is just a platitude. You haven't actually assimilated the experience, mm-hmm. you know, and so it, it's a journey to, especially in close relationships, to get to that place. It's, it's, you can't just sit there and say, oh, I know that women have been treated poorly for, you know, thousands of years. And so I forgive my mom for, you know, whatever she's done. Okay. That's nice. But you haven't Mm -hmm. really claimed, you know, the gifts of how she was. Like, how how did you benefit from everything she did and didn't do? How was that exactly what you needed in your soul's curriculum to become the person that you are today and doing what you're doing in service? How is that perfect? Mm -hmm. And then you don't have to say, I forgive you for that. You just say, wow, thank you. Thank Mm -hmm. you for making me into this person I am today, for giving me the opportunity Mm -hmm. to claim that for myself. Right, right. And in the book, you mentioned Ho'oponopono, which um, I've had, uh, who was, oh, Doria Cordova, DC Cordova. We did Mm. a a whole conversation on Ho'oponopono. Why don't you repeat for us? how you, how you use Ho'oponopono, because I think it's very effective. Yeah. So what I do is I'll use it. Like if I get into a situation where I feel very sticky Mm -hmm. and when I say sticky, I mean triggered or, you know, some part of it's hooked my attention. And I like to think of these things as Velcro. (laughs) Yes. Good metaphor. (laughs) (laughs) You know, Mm -hmm. then what I'll do is I'll just sit quietly and just keep putting that person in front of me or the situation even, and just saying, you know, I'll, sometimes I'll just say Ho'oponopono over and over again, that word, until Mm -hmm. I feel like the energy is cleared because it has a frequency and a vibration just just to that word alone. Right. Or I'll say, I'm sorry, please forgive me. 
I love you. Thank you. And then with each word is like a prayer, mm -hmm. releasing the energy. And then I just notice what's going on inside of me. You know, is something loosening up? Is something tense? Do I need a bigger breath? Mm -hmm. Is my, sh you know, is my inner perception of this person shifting? And I just keep going until I feel so ascended that the that it just feels shifted. It feels like it's in a different space, a more a space of more gratitude and love. Mm -hmm. Perfect. And I like to add um, a emotional freedom technique tapping. I yes, think that's, that's real. Yeah, between the two of those, you know, they're so simple, both ho'oponopono and tapping, and that I and I'm sure a lot of people are like me. You kind of forget about it. <laughs> You know, I mean, I've been doing emotional freedom techniques since the 90s, and I've gone years without remembering it. And then I'm like, oh, yeah, of course, that is just so powerful. And and Ho'opono, Pono too, on the surface, you know, the, the technique is, is simple, but it's very, both of those are very profound for releasing. It's not complicated. We just make it complicated. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, the ego makes it complicated because right. that keeps us in separation. Mm -hmm. And if we're in separation, the ego has power. Mm. That's true. I hadn't thought of it so, that way. So, you know, so, you know, I often tell people, like, don't try to get rid of the ego because you can't. Right. And it just creates more animosity, you know, mm -hmm. with your ego. Mm -hmm. like, really. So just love your ego like it's a little child. Like, just like imagine it's like a four-year-old or five-year-old child and just be really cuddly and just be like, yeah, you know, I want to show you something new. I want to show you something even more expanded than what you thought was possible. And I know this is what White Eagle does with me all the time because, you know, I, I'm living in the third dimension and part of my consciousness is, is wired for thinking I have to do everything. Mm -hmm. And I can get really busy trying to do it all. Right. <laughs> And I don't actually need to do that. I mean, I surrendered the book to him. The second wave, I said, okay, White Eagle, it's your book. So, you know, just make sure it stays on the charts. And it has, <laughs> like, 71 weeks. That's great. I'm like, listen, it's your job. I mean, it's your book. So, you know, if you, you're all powerful, right? You're a soul. If you want that to be on the charts, then it will be. Excellent perspective. I like that. There's not a whole lot I can do on the ground to make that happen. You know, right. it's kind of like that message of, of in that other lifetime when I left the people in my body, but I was there for them. Mm -hmm. Right. So Carrie, how do you help people transcend the human drama? What if like if somebody's listening in there and they are really feeling a connection with what you're saying, uh, you know, how can, what do you do to help people? Well, I, um, I work with people a number of ways. One way is through an individual healing session. Okay. So I do individual healing sessions for 30 minutes or an hour. Okay. Those are called rainbow light healings. Mm -hmm. I also have a deeper level healing that's called an illumination healing that I learned at the Four Winds Light Body School. Okay. And aside from individual healings, I do group mentoring. Mm -hmm. So I'm in 2021, I'm launching a one-year program that's a vision quest to help people to tap into their divine purpose for this lifetime. We'll be using the gene keys. We'll be walking the ancient path of the Incan and um, cultivating a personal mesa, which is a medicine bundle of stones, kuyas, mm -hmm. okay. and tying those to your gene keys so, and to your chakras. So mm -hmm. it's really powerful uh, as an alignment toward your your curriculum that you're working on in this lifetime and giving you a tangible um, allies in stone medicine to support you in working through that. And, you know, each of the gene keys is really fascinating. They mm -hmm. each have a shadow, a gift and a city. And the city is um, like a perfected state of right. that expression. So it's fascinating mm. to, uh, I, you know, this is a new, I'm adding in the gene keys this time because I think this is just really powerful. But yeah, mm -hmm. we're going to be practicing ancient wisdom to help you to get into your book of destiny and close that book of fate because that book of fate is the suffering state. So we want to get out of that and into the possibility. We want to break free from the cage, man. Yeah, like, yeah, absolutely. Get out of the cage and go into the freedom of like, 
you know, becoming what uh, Don Miguel Ruiz talks about in the four agreements of being the artist of your life. Right. We all have that potential, but only in the book of destiny. And it seems like 2021, it, this is even more important. It is because, um, well, the potential is there. So if you're prepared for the potential and, you know, the divine mother sees you working towards it, correct we're on earth we're in earth school she knows everything you're doing because you're in her body you know Mm -hmm. you can't escape her she knows everything she's like uh all powerful in this earth dimension so if we're if we're going to be tapped in there then and doing our work then things go a lot more gracefully um Mm -hmm. and if you resist the work well and you know just choose not to open that spiritual door then it's going to get rocky you know we've got another few years ahead of us of refinement to come out of separation and into oneness and into the divine flow of your soul's purpose and curriculum. Okay. So if you come along, then you get to float down the river and enjoy yourself and be amazed at everything. And if you don't come along, well, it gets rocky, right? You know, it gets ever more rocky as things in your life fall apart that you depended on for happiness. Interesting. Yeah. It's kind of like 2020. I mean, look what happened this year. It's going to be more of this oh, and more God. intense. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of scary. <laughs> it's know? only scary if you're resisting it. Cause mm-hmm. for me, it's been an awesome year. I want to say that like mm-hmm. 2020 for me has been great. Mm-hmm. It's been amazing. I got to go to Peru um, last month and take a small group of people in for a week retreat and be with the shamans and go to sacred locations and all of this. Meanwhile, a lot of other people were terrified to go and they canceled out. Mm -hmm. So I'm not afraid. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm not afraid either, but it just, it just seems like from where I am, like traveling is just such a pain right now. I'm not afraid of it, but you know, just all you have to go through. I often want, I wonder, you know, should I try to go somewhere or should I just stay home? (laughs) Well, there is that. So we wanted to go to Peru because we wanted to get our transformation going on. So if you're, if you lean into the transformation Mm -hmm. and you lean into the growth opportunity and you, you perceive it through these, these, um, new ways of seeing that I share with people and that, you know, you're aware of the soul Mm -hmm. perspective. Mm -hmm. If you come at it from there, it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Great, great opportunity guarding yourself like then it's going to be tough Mm -hmm. you know because stuff's going to change everything's going to change hopefully for the better of course it's always for the better we lean through the fear and it's always better on the other side Mm -hmm. so how can people connect with you my dear well uh let's see my website (laughs) is a good starting point (laughs) CarrieHummingbird.com is K-E-R-R-I Hummingbird.com. Okay. And there's everything is linkable from that website. And I, I also have a podcast called Soul Nectar Show. And so people can definitely tune in there for fascinating conversation. Cool. Okay. And if you want to do the book, the book is up at Amazon.com. It's also on my website. Okay. The Second Wave, Transcending the Human Drama. And my new book is... Uh, there's some downloads available of the first two chapters at motherwoundbook.com. Mm-hmm. Mother you have to put the book, so motherwoundbook.com. Okay, I will put that all that on the website too. Um, and and if people want to uh, have a session with you, they can book that from the website. So okay. there's like a little cool little scheduling tool, and there's um, there's a page on the site under mentoring that talks about what happens in the healing sessions. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I I was actually very impressed with your, your whole scheduling system. It's quite, uh, I don't know. It's very robust. It's, you get emails constantly. Don't forget your appointment. (laughs) Yeah. You get reminded. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's quite thorough. That's the word I want. <laughs> That's to assist people in transformation who often have inner resistance. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And lots of help, lots mm-hmm. of support. So is there anything else that uh, you'd like to share with people? Do you have a, a gift? I actually yeah. do have a gift. Thanks for mentioning that. I almost forgot about it. 
Yeah, I have this really fun Oracle game Hmm. that I downloaded a a year ago. And it's called the Love Mastery Game. Okay. And instead of telling you, like, when something's going to happen or something like that, it it tells you why it's happening. Ah. It gives you insight. Okay. And it's all about your soul's curriculum. Mm -hmm. So you, you basically... Um, print out the sheets. It's all free. So you print out the sheets from the website. Eventually I'll make cards and all that, but it just, you know, there's a process there. Mm -hmm. So this is just print out the sheets. And then if you get a a 12 sided dice, you can roll the dice, which I think is fun Mm because it's like life is like rolling the dice. And so you roll the dice and then you can see like what allies on earth are here to support you Mm -hmm. and what medicine they have. Like tobacco might be one of your allies and well, what support could you get from tobacco and what insight does that give you? Mm -hmm. And then it'll tell you like what state of being you're being encouraged to be in through this challenge you're having. What's the state of being you're learning? And then what's the mastery principle? Are you learning about forgiveness? You know, what's your mastery principle you're working on with this challenge? So with that information, you can sit back and really contemplate. These are my allies and this is my state of being and this is my mastery principle I'm working on. So that gives me a lot of information about why this thing's happening for me, through Mm -hmm. me. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, it sounds both fun and profound at the same time. <laughs> it, it is. It's very handy and it's right on, you know, so I love that little game. Um, so that's available for my website too. And the carriehummingbird.com forward slash play. Okay. Forward slash play. That's where we get it. Okay. Which is fun. It's yeah. Fun to- I'm going to check that out. That sounds great. Any last bit of wisdom to keep people inspired, keep them moving forward? <laughs> Well, I mean, this is an evolution. So Mm -hmm. stop beating yourself up for not being perfect because you actually came here to not be perfect and find your way back to perfection. So, Mm -hmm. and we're, and since we're infinitely perfecting, perfection is a moving target. So I think everyone can just relax a little bit and enjoy the ride. You know, it's just, you know, get into the state of mind of, Life is revealing itself to me for my edification and my enjoyment at a soul level of how I'm growing and learning through all of these experiences that are being brought to my doorstep. Mm -hmm. And then that's, it's a more enjoyable way of being in relationship with this life experience. I like that life is revealing itself to me. I like that, that phrase just, I hadn't thought of it that way, but. That does give a more open-ended, I guess, I guess I'd say positive kind of sense of, I like that better than my, I'm taking it one day at a time. <laughs> you know, that, that's like a chore. It's like, oh, yeah, exactly. God, I'm taking it one yeah. day at a time. Yes, it is. So I like, I like that, that perspective of life is revealing itself to me every day. I think that's a good, uh, a good phrase to keep in mind. And this might be the only day you have. You don't know. Right. Yeah. Yep. So, you know, that helps me to be grateful Mm -hmm. no matter what's happening because I don't know if I have tomorrow. So I'm going to be grateful right now for what I have. Good point. Wow. Carrie, this has really been a fun conversation. I've really enjoyed it. And I think um, it's packed with a lot of, a lot of good uh, thoughts wisdom and um, thank you so much I really enjoyed this I enjoyed it too thank you so much for inviting me well you're very welcome and I look forward to following your work and see where you take it (laughs) thank you so much and I look forward to maybe having you on Soul Nectar show and exploring some conversation there too oh that would be fun I'd like that I haven't been on anybody else's podcast I, I don't know. I've kind of felt like I don't know that I really have much to say, but maybe that would be fun. Maybe I would accept your your uh, invitation. Yay. That would <laughs> probably be the first time I've actually felt like it. <laughs> wow, that's cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We'll talk about that. Okay. Okay. Well, you take care and thank you so much. Thank you. Have a blessed day. You too. Thank you so much, Carrie Hummingbird, for sharing your wisdom, inspiration, your passion with us. I really appreciate it. The podcast website is realjanine.com. 
And as always, Janine is J-A-N-E-A-N. Go to your favorite podcast provider to subscribe to Keeping It Real with Janine. And if you're a fan of YouTube, there are video slideshows of all of my conversations. Do you know someone who would enjoy my conversation with Carrie Hummingbird? I'm sure you do. Please help out and share with your friends and family. Thanks for listening. Take care and be well. Be well.